Crystal Rogers is the mother of five children. She's a beloved daughter, a wonderful sister, and somebody that her friends, her family, the community all describe as this amazing human being. But Crystal is also at the center of a case, of a missing persons case, that runs so deep and so far and has so many different connections to it. it it's hard to grasp the entire thing and that this could be going on in one town to one family. Today we're going to be talking about the disappearance of Crystal Rogers. Now this took place back on July 4th weekend of 2015. That's when everything kind of kicked off. She was last seen alive on July 3rd. Now Crystal's cousin would say that she she saw Crystal leaving a Walmart earlier that day. Her ex-husband would say that she dropped a couple of their kids off with them. So later in the day, at some point, Crystal's mother, Sherry, she said that, you know what, I got a call from my granddaughter, uh, one of Crystal's children, and she was basically like, look, you know, where's mom? I can't get a hold of her. What's going on? So this, of course, prompts Crystal's mother to try and reach out to her herself and get a hold of her, which, of course, this, you know, goes into other family members trying to get a hold of her. Now, also, her family members would later say that her boyfriend, Brooks Hauk, he and her had, like, a little date July 3rd. And even Brooks himself would later say to police when he was being interviewed and whatnot that, yeah, they did have a little date. And he took Crystal to his family's farm, to his mother's farm, and they fed the cows and stuff like that. And then they returned back to his house. Now, Brooks would even tell police later when he was being interviewed, Brooks would say, uh, you know what? I went to bed that night and Crystal stayed up playing a game on her phone, something like that, in another room. And so then the next day rolls around. So we're at July 4th now. And Brooks will claim, you know what? I got up. Brooks and Crystal shared a child together. They had a child together. They didn't share him. They had a child together. So they should have a child together. He wakes up. Said child is in the bed with him, but Crystal is nowhere to be found. And Brooks will say that he just eventually goes to the family gathering at the family farm uh, with the baby later on. Now, all this while, like, mother instincts have been going on. You know, remember, the mom and the other family members like, you know, where is she? So eventually, this all comes to light. Now, this is happening over like you know a, a small amount of time we're talking about july 4th weekend so and the same note that mr brooks is over here waking up with the child in bed no crystal around okay well we'll just go to mom's house for our little gather her family is like looking for her now another point of interest during all of this is going to be the fact that her family is like look brooks was like completely nonchalant about this and guess what he didn't help look for her either. Okay, so let's jump to that Sunday. We're still at July 4th weekend. Remember, a ton of stuff happens like right off the rip in this. So Sunday, major developments come. Someone spotted Crystal's maroon-colored Chevy sedan at mile marker 14 on the Bluegrass Parkway. So said person calls Crystal's father, Tommy Ballard. Tommy and Crystal's brother go to said spot. Now, when they get there, what they're going to find is very unsettling to them because he knows his daughter, he, the brother knows his sister, and this isn't like her. So what they find are the car keys, her purse, and an uncharged cell phone. So right off the rip, like those are the ingredients for not good stuff. So also what is going on is they said that the tires looked like kind of flat, but not like, oh my God, you know, we're stranded kind of flat. Almost like somebody had kind of let the air out of them and one was a little bit flatter than the other. It was almost as if it was set up to look like something had gone wrong with her car. She pulled over on the side of the road and maybe went for help or something like that. Well, there's a whole bunch of red flags with that. First of all, they were like, look, the car could still be driven. You know, it wasn't that bad off. Secondly, they were like, look, Crystal was like super overly cautious. She would never have just like pulled over. Certainly would have like left all this stuff and just gone wandering off. And the brother also says, you know what? The driver's seat was in a position that Crystal like never sat in. Like somebody else drove this car here. And he says it was a setup. It was a plan. Now, again, so with this bit of evidence, like this is where the family and all the search people, they focus in on this area. They don't find anything. Amazingly enough, Brooks doesn't help in this search either. So fast forward a couple of days, July 6th, a reward is posted, $25,000. I mean, they are on it. Okay, they want their loved one home. 
So July 7th, you know, investigators are like, look, Brooks, we, we need to talk to you. You need to come in and answer some questions. So they bring him in. But before we go off on that tangent, let's just talk about a few key components of the relationship. So first of all, Crystal and Brooks met when she rented a house from him. Now, Brooks basically comes from what sounds like kind of a well-to-do family, uh, very well respected in that town. Now, of course, this is like a small town. So, you know, everybody knows everybody type situation. And so so there's that going on. Now his brother, his name is Nick. Now remember that because that's going to become relevant as we go further. His brother at the time at least was a Bardstown police officer. And again, like I said before, of the five children that Crystal had, one of them was with Brooks. Now one thing I found really interesting was in the documentary, The Disappearance of Crystal Rogers, uh, some very telling information was brought out about like the dynamics between Crystal and Brooks and regards to like the relationship and how the children were viewed. Crystal's mother said, you know what, Brooks never took to Crystal's children that were not his. And in fact, she cited an example where she was like, you know what, when they went grocery shopping, Brooks would make her pay for those children's food separately. And I was just like, oh my God, are you kidding me? Red sofa flag, major number one right there before you even get to all the other red flags. Also in this documentary, you know, one of the things that Brooks said at one point, trying to play off like, this is why I wasn't concerned, is he was like, look, I thought she went to her cousin's house. She has his cousin, that's where Crystal goes. You know, when we get into argument, you know, yada, yada, yada. Well, they talked to said cousin in this documentary. And that cousin's like, mm -mm, no, not really. She's like, you know what? Uh, Crystal maybe came over to my house like in that kind of, of situation the circumstances maybe twice and she never spent the night so where Brooks was trying to make it sound like this is just like a regular normal thing which if you accepted that you also did then have to accept that they regularly fought and argued enough for her to leave and stay the night out so there's a whole bunch going on there regardless the cousin's like nope not true next okay so let's reel me back in here we're at the police interview brooks is been brought on he's being questioned so they are questioning him this goes on for a while his brother nick remember nick he's the bardstown police officer he calls Brooks on the phone and he's basically like look what's going on you know you're in the interview are they letting you go are they trying to like you know hammer you with questions and he's like you know what you need to get up and leave like right now you need to get up and leave and shut up and guess what that's exactly what Brooks did he got up and left you can imagine how that went over with the officers especially with Nick We'll get to that in a minute. So July 10th, they execute a search warrant. And guess where they execute this search warrant for? The Hauk family property. Bing, bing, bing. This is allegedly the last place that she was seen alive. That being said, they were very tight-lipped about anything that they did or did not find. They didn't really put much information out there. So fast forward a few more days, July 15th. Okay, let's go back to Nick, the brother of Brooks. So basically the police are just like, look, you need to come in and talk to us about this whole situation. And Nick is basically like, you know what? I wish I could help you, but I don't have any information. Neither does my brother and I'm not gonna do so. It took the chief of police calling Nick and making him come in. That is not a cute look. So he goes in for the interview, begrudgingly, and y'all, as you can imagine, he is like not helpful in this at all. He all of a sudden has this very forgetful memory. Remember, this is like a week ago of stuff that they're asking him. He doesn't remember like what happened after, you know, his brother left the interview and yada, yada, yada. So then the investigators are like, you know, they're like, we're gonna throw a few whammies this way. And they're like, well, we have video of you and your brother Brooks headed towards the family property within a couple hours after that interview. What did you do there? And he literally just keeps on with, I don't remember that. I have no memory of that. I don't know what we did there. I blacked it out. Yada, yada, yada. He's not budging. So eventually the investigators, they ask him to take a polygraph. And as you can imagine, drum roll please, he doesn't pass it. In fact, he doesn't pass it really bad on certain questions, ones that pertain to if he knows where Crystal is. Even though 
he was like completely positive, I'm gonna pass this test, I'm gonna pass this test. So now we're gonna jump forward in time. We seem to do that a lot in this case, but nonetheless, here we are. So October 15th. Now, lots of big stuff happens here. Some of the stuff is good and some of the stuff is not good, but all around it is what it is. So the first thing is that the sheriff uh, says that, you know what, Crystal Rogers is presumed dead at this point. So the sheriff says that, you know what, Crystal Rogers is presumed dead. He's like, there's just things that happen when you're alive, when you're walking this earth that take place and none of those have taken place with Crystal. So that's obviously bad news. Uh, so there's that. Secondly, Nick, the sheriff, Brooke's brother is fired from the police department and guess what for he is fired for failing that polygraph and interfering with the investigation so absolutely not a cute look for him now lastly Brooks is announced as being the only suspect in this case even though like no arrest or charges or anything like that were made I mean it's like a known thing at this point like look that's who we're looking at now things go quiet for a spell in this case that's one of the things that's like just so intriguing about this case because with all the stuff that happened you know you would start to think oh god here we go we're gonna get a resolution something so december of 2015. now this is something that is very on brand for this case and what's taking place in december at least what we're going to talk about right now uh is somebody else loosely involved in the case and like i said this is very on brand for this case there's lots of different people who have a varying level of involvement in all of the shenanigans that took place with us. But oftentimes, a lot of them kind of relate back to Brooks. So an arrest was made, like, kind of in relation to it, but not directly to what happened to Crystal. Uh, and oddly and coincidentally enough, the arrest was to an employee of Brooks. So he lied to a grand jury about his whereabouts during the time that Crystal went missing. So this did not go over well, and they you know, held to it, and they hit him with charges. And he ended up getting sentenced to like a year in prison. Now they did kind of like downgrade the charges that he got out early, but nonetheless, totally suspect. Now here's the thing, while all of this stuff has been going on, Crystal's father, Tommy, literally has been searching high and low for his daughter. I mean, he has like made it his life's mission. If you ever go missing or a loved one or something like that, like he is who you want on your side. Now, again, this is something that Tommy has had to deal with before. The level of tragedy in this case and how it stretches across generations is just mind boggling. So Tommy's sister, Crystal Zan, she too went missing. Now this was way back when, this is in 1979, although that's not really way back when because that's basically when I was born. So let's just say it was almost like yesterday. But regardless, she went missing from Bardstown uh, in 1979. Now she was pregnant at the time of her disappearance. Her family, I mean, they searched, they pleaded, they did everything they could. They even took out a front page ad on the newspaper on the day that was supposed to be the baby's due date, March 22nd. So, I mean, it's completely heart-wrenching. Now, just like her niece, uh, Crystal's aunt's car was found eventually. It was found in Clarksville, Indiana, along the Ohio River. Now, they found it with a big rock on the gas pedal. Now, what would end up happening, though, is they would get, you know, as much of a resolution as you can to cases like this. Uh, it ended up that Crystal's aunt's estranged husband is who did away with her and their unborn child. Now, it would turn out that Crystal's aunt's remains would be found on a farm in like 1982. And also, this was not found far from where Crystal's situation happened, from where she went missing, from where the car was. Now, her aunt's remains told a horrific story of murder and burning and the whole nine yards. Even sadder is why this took place. Her husband, or estranged husband, was trying to get out of child support. I mean, obviously there's a lot more going on there to go from zero to that, you know, in that amount of time, but literally it was like all these other things, just completely senseless. Now that husband in that case, the estranged husband, I keep forgetting to say that, he would eventually get life in prison for this. So, you know, at least there was that, but 
fast forward so you can imagine when Tommy's daughter goes missing, Crystal, she goes missing. Imagine what this did to him. It was like, I've already been here before. You know, like what, whoever put us here, what is the lesson for me to learn that this keeps coming up? So this completely drove Tommy to like want to find and get answers. And he was uncovering a lot of stuff. And sadly, a lot of that stuff that he was uncovering, as he would say, it was way bigger than Crystal, it was way bigger than Bardstown. He was getting into stuff that would unfortunately cost him his own life. November 19th, 2016, Tommy is taking his grandson hunting on some family property. And, you know, obviously it's a little sketchy as to what exactly happens, but, you know, what I can put together watching the documentary and listening to the brother and all that is, you know, Tommy goes, he parks, he has his grandson, they're getting out, they're walking, and the grandson's basically like, look, you know, Grandpa, like, you know, stopped me and looked off to a certain area in the tree line and kind of, like, looked through with his scope. And when he did, shots rang, and his grandfather was shot right in front of him. Tommy's son would say, and as well as in the documentary that I told you about, that on this tree line where the, you know, grandson pointed to where this allegedly happened, there was like this little area that was cut out. So literally it was like someone had gone and prepared for this. Like they knew where Tommy was going to be, what was going on, yada, yada, yada. And it was very suspect. They do some tests in this documentary to show like how it could have been done with somebody waiting there, a car coming by right off the road, picking them up, and they're gone. They're out of there. And at the end of the day, no one has been charged or caught in this crime. And another member of this family is gone too soon without answers. So another shady character in this situation. Uh, again, let's do the time warp. I'm, I need to like channel my inner Rocky Horror here and just like go with the time warp because we keep doing this. But regardless, we're in July of 2017. Now we are going to use another person by the name of Crystal. So we're going to go by first and last name. Really big on this because y'all know me in names. I do not want to keep messing this up. This person's name was Crystal Dawn. Crystal Dawn is the girlfriend of Brooks Hauk. Very odd, very strange that they had the same name. It is what it is. Maybe Brooks has a type. Regardless, she gets arrested. And you're not going to believe what she was arrested for. She is arrested for stealing signs like around the town especially when they show uh this documentary there are signs like everywhere you know for information on crystal uh not crystal dawn crystal rogers uh, yeah, justice for crystal rogers you know and tommy all this stuff like literally everywhere so crystal dawn brooks girlfriend is going and stealing and taking down the signs. Now, I'm sure other people were doing this, but she just seemed to have gotten caught. Now, what's also of interest is in the documentary when they're talking to uh, Chris Rogers' mother, and she starts saying, you know, yeah, all the signs started disappearing, and she's like, I knew exactly who it was. And then this situation happens. So that action alone is so telling. Now, again, allegedly, this is all my opinion, nothing, whatever, but look at how many people surrounding Brooks are getting caught up, getting caught up in this kind of behavior. It's very interesting. So let's fast forward to April of 2019. I almost forgot. Let's do the time warp to April 2019. So this, again, is a side note. This is just character building, if you will. Brooks is acquitted in a jury trial over some theft charges that took place back in 2018. Now, basically, what he got charged with was stealing shingles, roofing shingles from Lowe's. It all came down to he was essentially paying for a certain amount of them and then leaving with a different amount. So it was almost like two for me, one for you, two for me, one for you. The employee that testified was basically saying, you know what, like he did this one shady thing where he had a receipt and then, you know, he got the order, but then he came back with said receipt and picked up more and then tried to play it off like, oh God, I just got confused. And so it was all shady, it was all suspect, but he got off of those charges, he was acquitted and it, it is what it is, but nonetheless it's just one of those things where i'm like how does one person keep getting 
caught up in all this stuff. Now, 2019, even more recent, uh, another thing happens. So one of his houses, Brooks' houses, is burnt down. And now the house is being built. So basically, first of all, there's no electricity. There's no gas, no nothing like that. It's like a frame. It gets burnt down. And the fire chief or whoever, he's like, you know what? I think it was a disgruntled former employee. And at this point, I'm like, yeah. I mean, this is completely on brand for this dude at this point. Why is there all this bad energy that surrounds him? It's like just, you know, Good things just aren't happening around him, it seems. So let's get into the, the most recent stuff that has fired this case back up. So as you've seen, as you heard, whatever, you know, all this stuff took place. It's seemingly like, oh my gosh, why haven't charges been brought up? Yada, yada, yada. Well, the case, as you can imagine, it went cold. Like nothing was coming of it. Well, until recently. So July, 2020. So a few months ago at the time of this recording, human remains were found near where Christopher was last seen. Now, the FBI had to assist in getting to said remains because they were, I guess, really difficult to get to. So the FBI jumps in and the remains were sent to Quantico, Virginia for testing. Now, even more interesting. So at the time of this recording, uh, we are currently waiting on like DNA stuff to come back to say for sure, you know, hey, is this crystal? You know, so at the time of this recording, we don't know that yet. But the remains were sent off to Quantico and they came back and they're like, look, but it is a female and the person appeared to stand between 5'2 and 5'11. Well, Crystal Rogers was like around 5'9, so it's almost like right in there. So there's that. That is major. I am sure the family is like waiting with bated breath as everyone is. So all that being said, August of 2020, the FBI basically takes this case over and they're like, look, we're launching all new searches, all new interviews, the whole shebang. Now, you know how we see like in the movies and TV shows and all this where these agencies act like really territorial with one another? Like, no, this is our case. I'm going to do it. Well, the FBI has said, you know what? We're working with like everybody to get this solved. So, you know, hopefully that is the way that's going and everybody's cooperating to bring answers and justice to Crystal and her family. Now, of course, as you can imagine, these ongoing investigations also, you know, the FBI isn't out here telling everybody what they're doing, but they have confirmed like, yeah, you know what? A lot of these searches and interviews and stuff are revolving around Brooks, his brother, and the family property. The FBI has set up a website for this case. It's really informative. It has a lot of information. There are other cases in and around this area, unsolved cases that need to be looked at as well that, you know, at this point they can't confirm if they're really attached or not to it. The documentary goes into them a little bit more and they're horrific and they're sad and they're heartbreaking. The website here also lists these because again, there's all these unsolved cases in this very short amount of time. And they're not just like random little cases. I mean, these are like heinous crimes. Now, one of those cases is just like I said, it's Crystal's own father, Tommy. So there's that. Now, another one is a police officer. His name is Jason Ellis. Uh, he was a Bardstown police officer. Now, he was driving home. It was, like, really late at night. And he got off of the exit, and there was, like, debris in the road or whatever. And so, even it being late at night like that and, like, no one on the road, he was going to stop and get that stuff off the road so that nobody hurt themselves or, you know, whatever. So, he does this, and literally when he gets out of the car and walks up, He's, I guess we're going to say ambushed. He was essentially shot several times and left for dad. Now, again, in the documentary, they do kind of almost like a reenactment of how they go to the area and they lay it all out. And it really does look like somebody was literally staking out up on this kind of hill. Like they knew what they were doing. They knew who they were waiting for. And it's a horrible loss of life, but it also leaves these questions as to why did that take place? Was he too getting close to something that he shouldn't have in the investigation? Now, another one that's highlighted on this website as well as the documentary, this one's, y'all, this one's bad. Okay, it's bad. I shouldn't even talk about it, but we'll talk about it a little bit. The victims are Kathy and Samantha Netherland. This is a mother and daughter. 
Kathy was the mother, she was a special ed teacher, and Samantha was the daughter, and she was only 16. So April 22nd, 2014, uh, neither Kathy or Samantha show up to school. Well, obviously, this is like, what's going on? You know, what happened? This is weird. So a relative finally goes over to the house to check and, you know, be like, what's up? What they find, y'all, is Texas Chainsaw Massacre type stuff. Both Kathy and Samantha had been tied up. They had been brutally tortured. I mean, the whole nine yards, it's bad. Okay, it's bad. And left. So there's that. Uh, you know, it was terrible. It's no way that anybody should leave this earth at all. And again, just like all of these other cases, all of these other victims that I've talked about, whoever has done this stuff to them, and I'm not trying to say it's the same person, we don't know, but they're still free. They're still walking around. So again, I'm going to put some links down in the description uh, where you can go to you know, check out the FBI's website. Again, for the documentary, the if you want to watch it, about the Crystal Rogers one, and it touches on all this stuff here. It's absolutely awesome i ripped through it you will enjoy it if you have not seen it i'll put a link down there so you can check that out too uh but that's it if you want to see more of my commentary on things just click on the videos that are playing right now and i'll talk to you soon